There's nothing like falling in love. The world fills with colour, life is full of promise and possibility, and your body fizzes with excitement and euphoria. It's heady stuff. So, why does it stop? Why is it hard to hang on to that glorious feeling of electric attraction in long term relationships? And this question can seem particularly urgent if desire fades and other people start to seem extraordinarily attractive. In this video, we analyse the neuroscience of how and why romantic desire surges and fades. Hi, my name is Tom Bellamy. I'm a neuroscientist and writer, and I blog all about limerence at livingwithlimerence.com. I'm also the author of Smitten, which explains what limerence is, how neuroscience can help us make sense of it, and how to recover from it. Okay, so what's going on in the brain when romantic attraction fades? Now, this question tends to occur to people under two different circumstances. The first is frustration about the loss of romantic connection. Desire seems such a core part of romantic attachment that the fading of attraction during a long term relationship that's otherwise good is obviously distressing. Very few people intend to end up in a sexless marriage, it just happens in degrees of fading desire. The second context is the opposite problem when we can't turn off an infatuation that's spiralled out of control and is causing us harm. This sort of obsessive infatuation is known as limerence and can be well understood as addiction to another person. Why is it that desire can be so intense in limerence but then fade away in long term love? Now, a quick Google search on why romantic feelings fade throws up some common answers. Getting to know someone intimately removes the excitement of novelty. Time causes a transition from kind of lusty desire to companionship. You can't sustain euphoria forever, you'd be exhausted. And our neurochemistry shifts from the dopamine and noradrenaline highs of infatuation to a hormonal contentedness during attachment. Now, these answers aren't wrong, but they aren't complete either. We all know that familiarity eventually decreases excitement about somebody that we're attracted to, but how does it happen and why is it different with different people? Similarly, it's undoubtedly true that the firing in reward and arousal circuits in the brain decreases with time, but that's really just describing the machine through which our feelings operate. It's a bit like saying that deceleration in a car is caused by less fuel being injected into the combustion chamber. Really, it was the decision to take your foot off the gas pedal that caused it. So I think most people asking the question, why do romantic feelings fade, are curious about what factors trigger the change in neurochemistry and perhaps most importantly when it comes to life satisfaction, whether they can be hacked to slow them down or speed them up. Pleasure fades over time. It's a central feature of psychology, and as you might therefore expect, there's a large body of published research that analyzes the problem from multiple perspectives. Turns out that it's complicated. There are multiple levels of desire and multiple levels of satiation. There's more than one way to experience a pleasure, and there's lots of ways to get tired of a reward. Now, perhaps the best studied case is the pleasure of food. And it's a good one because it seems simple, but it isn't. So if you gorge yourself on a lot of sweet food, you will soon feel sick of it. Sugar still tastes good and it activates the same sensory neurons in your mouth, but you've lost the desire to consume it. And that loss of desire comes from multiple levels. At the most fundamental levels, there are physiological feedback mechanisms. So a full stomach that becomes distended or taste receptors get overstimulated, your blood sugar levels rise, and all of those processes suppress your appetite. Now at the next level up, there's whether or not you want to eat more sugar. So after binging, the thought of sweetness becomes aversive, even nauseating. And finally, at perhaps the highest cognitive level, 
There's how you think about sugary foods intellectually. And this can depend on your general mood, your values, your attitude to life and health. And you might resist the idea of sweet rewards because you're sticking to a diet or because you want to avoid the inevitable post-sugar slump or maybe because you've developed diabetes. Now, these multiple levels of desire all need to be understood if you want to know why romantic cravings pass sooner or later than you'd like. But I'd argue that the key point of control is at that middle level of wanting. The process of learning to suppress a response is known as habituation. It's a fundamental feature of neurophysiology and it describes the phenomenon where repeated exposure to a stimulus, either good or bad, leads to a diminished response over time. You get used to things that happen repeatedly. And this process allows you to stop wanting things that are easily obtained and stop fearing things that are easily avoided. So if you repeatedly listen to a song that you really like, you'll tire of it. If you eat your favourite meal every day, it will lose its appeal. If you constantly consume erotica, you'll become jaded. Habituation is the mechanism through which exposure to rewards leads to fading desire. It's a learned suppression of response. Importantly though, how well and how quickly the lesson is learned depends on some key factors about the stimulus. Number one, the stimulus strength. So more powerful desires take longer to habituate. Number two, the stimulus rate. If a reward is presented frequently, it habituates quickly. If it's less common, it will habituate slowly. Number three, stimulus variability. If a reward is predictable, it habituates quickly. If it's unpredictable, it habituates slowly. Number four, spontaneous recovery. Now, if a reward is inaccessible for a long time, the habituation process can reverse. Number five, dishabituation. If an extra stimulus is given with a habituated reward or the strength or the context of the reward is changed, habituation can reverse. And number six, sensitization. Some rewards initially increase in strength before habituation begins. The strength of your romantic desire and how long it lasts will depend on all of these factors. When you've been with somebody for a long time, habituation of the arousal and pleasure responses to them inevitably occurs. And this is an active process in the brain. It requires lots of hormonal and neurotransmitter systems. But the focal point seems to be our old friend, the dopamine reward system. Desire is a combination of excitement and motivation to seek reward. That's what the wanting drive basically is. Now, as I've discussed in a previous video, I'll put a link below. Feedback from the orbitofrontal cortex to the striatum, the pleasure centers in the striatum, is the main mechanism for regulating reward seeking and making sense of desire. Now, while this is important for self-discipline, that same pathway, that feedback mechanism, regulates the habituation process too. It decreases dopamine release in the hedonic hotspots of the striatum, diminishing the intensity of erotic desire for your mate. Now, if your relationship is stable and your trust with your partner is good and you enjoy regular intimacy, this system will work as intended and you'll become habituated to the romantic and erotic reward that they provide. Bluntly, there's no more need to sort of urgently seek reward because you can access it predictably. Let's say you've become infatuated with somebody you shouldn't have. Let's say they are unpredictable, access to them is uncertain, that you sometimes get to spend wonderfully arousing time with them, but then you have long stretches of time where they're unavailable or they're moody or they're with someone else. A quick look through the factors that influence stimulus habituation will show you how that will affect your brain. 
Stimuli that change in strength are unpredictable, sometimes inaccessible, or ex are experienced in different contexts. Resist habituation. If you're trying to get over infatuation for somebody that you can't be with, it will be difficult to naturally suppress the desire for them. And this also explains why limerence can change in severity even after you've started to feel less obsessed. So a period of success in avoiding the object of your infatuation can ironically cause dishabituation, making them even more desirable when you next encounter them, especially if it's by chance. And as a final observation, addiction is defined as a craving that's difficult to resist even after the pleasure has passed and it's having a negative effect on your life. And there's pretty good evidence that the habituation process in the dopamine reward system is compromised in addiction. At least there's good evidence for drugs of abuse, but it's not hard to believe the same is true for behavioural addictions or when you're caught in a debilitating romantic obsession like limerence. The feedback from the orbitofrontal cortex to suppress that limerent object-seeking behaviour just doesn't work as effectively. Okay, so understanding how the habituation process is regulated in the brain is useful for explaining both loss of desire in long-term relationships and the insatiable craving of limerence, but it's also useful for scheming about how to exploit it to get the outcome that you want. If you're frustrated by a stale relationship that feels like it's lost its spark, then you need to do things that will promote spontaneous recovery or dishabituation. That means disrupting the stable routines of romantic life, introducing new stimuli alongside some romantic cues, and adding some unpredictability to your romantic rewards. So the old advice of spicing things up, doing new things with your partner, seeing them in a new context, and just being less habitual in your behaviour, really do have a justification in neuroscience. Now, you might never recapture the giddy thrills of early love, but you can definitely jolt your brain out of the worst dullness of habituation. Now, if in contrast you are frustrated by the insatiable desire of limerence, you want to do the opposite. So you can't habituate the desire away by forming a stable bond with them if they're unavailable, but there are strategies available to decrease the reward that they offer and to activate your prefrontal cortex to drive feedback suppression indirectly. Now, I've outlined many of these methods in a previous video on how to overcome limerence, and again, I'll put a link in the description below. But this is where that self-reflection as the highest cognitive level of desire comes in. So cultivating self-discipline, avoiding using limerence for mood regulation, and looking for new healthier rewards through purposeful living can work wonders in breaking the spell of limerence. So romantic desire fades because our brains are built to habituate to predictable, repetitive rewards. This is an essential feature of life in a complex environment, but it is a shame that it also means that healthy, happy relationships can tend towards romantic suppression, while wild, unstable infatuations remain powerfully hard to resist. More positively, in either scenario, there are practical steps that you can take to work with the intrinsic properties of your neural systems to better regulate desire. If you found this video useful, check out this one next on what's going on in the brain during the development of person addiction. Thanks for watching, subscribe if you'd like more, and I'll see you next time.